The Santa Barbara wine country's accomplishments rival those of some of the most famous regions. In very little time, Santa Barbara has asserted itself as one of the most prominent regions in the world. Often, it takes nearly a century for a region to gain notoriety. But for the winemakers in Santa Barbara, it took little over 50 years. So how did Santa Barbara go from toiling in the soil in the 1970s to winning Region of the Year in 2021? From generation to generation, the young wine region's rapid rise to prominence is reflected in cooperation, innovation, and a sacred passing of knowledge. Dedicated winemakers upholding these values and standards have paved the way for Santa Barbara's success throughout the years. This is their story. Where'd it go as we climb this mountain? While we show It's our revolution We thank those pioneers Who saw the vision clear Now it's our turn The groundwork and the path Will help us remember This is where we stand On the shoulders of giants As we climb the The history and lineage of Santa Barbara uh, wine country uh, begins in the 70s, early 70s, with Richard Sanford and Michael Benedict planting the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard. Zach Mesa is another one. Byron uh, and Ken Brown. Basically, tabula rasa, no grapes here. They checked the climate. They found, looked at the soils, found it was a good, good place to plant, started, make, started making wine. How do you decide when no grapes are planted in an area to all of a sudden plant grapes. It's incredible. Most of the winemakers around here talk about the pioneers being the ones in the 1980s that started to make wine that was specific to this region. There was this group of Zach and Mesa, which you could almost call Santa Barbara University, right? Jim Clendenin and Bob Lindquist and Adam Tolmack and Lane, Kathy Joseph was there for a while too. And that was like, the, that was the early beginnings of Santa Barbara County being recognized as being a, a really good wine region. So that first group of young winemakers, they realized that this was worthy of making world-class wine. And so they started to bottle uh, only Santa Barbara County wines. They built wineries here and based their whole production on the wines that were grown locally. So when I came into the game in 1991, you know, I, I read about them. I read about them in magazines. I studied them. I read about what they did. I studied their kind of techniques, if you will, that would be written about in, in wine magazines and in wine store kind of sales catalogs. And I memorized, I mean, I just, I pursued every inch of what they did. And if you look at it today, we have Santa Barbara County producing some of literally the best wines on the planet. And I think that that ability to go from such humble beginnings to such stellar wines in such a relatively short period of time it all comes down to that sense of community. And when I look at the arc, you know, from Lane Tanner to Wes Hagen to Jessica Gaska and beyond, that sense of community is what defines the region. 
first generation, absolute visionaries. You look at like Lane Tanner and, and being a part of that generation and being one of the first women in wine, she's, she's a visionary. Well, we always like to call Lane the OG and that would be the original girl. There were very few women making wine when she started. And I think she opened a lot of doors for a lot of women who wanted to make wine um, when essentially it was a man's world. And now there's, there's more of us here than there is in most parts of the world. So uh, she certainly led that and, and kind of provided the, um, you know, the, the vision that we could do that. You know, Lane Tanner, you know, along with just a small handful of other people, really put Santa Barbara on the map as far as, you know, kind of world-class wines. She taught people about Pinot Noir. For one thing, I mean, those early wines that she made, and I wish I still had some because I'm sure they're aging beautifully. But when you go into like my cellar, there is no Lane Tanner wines left. I just drank them because they were so delicious. She's a very skilled winemaker, and she is one of those proponents of low alcohol wines. And I'll, I'll tell you what, her wines age beautifully. In fact, they, they are um, just perfumed and very pretty, you know, way down the road. I've been very impressed with her wines over the years from her hair to her vibe to the tie-dye shirts to you know hitting on guys at tastings to driving a pink jaguar to to kind of holding on to the wine style that she believed in when general tides in wine style had were, were kind of going a different direction she was very much her it was neutral oak it was purity it was precision it was beauty um and she's never changed that she's always been really smart and really studious and so she just spent a lot of time studying and um, getting good grades, so she got a lot of scholarships to go to college, and um, she graduated with high honors. Lane didn't go to winemaking school. She has a degree in chemistry, and she learned winemaking from doing it. There's been, I'm sure, evolution and refinement and fine-tuning along the way, but I would argue that her starting point was really high. She came out of the gates, like all systems go, and precise and top of her game. Lane's influenced the region in all kinds of ways. Pinot Noir, Pinot and her style, um, you know, vineyard designating, you know, her, her kind of science background, there's precision to her wines, there's purity in her wines. I think her most important influence has been passing on the knowledge of the importance of a proper pick date. So the day that you harvest fruit, she has always picked very early on the harvest calendar. She was like a bellwether to us. It was like, it was a no-brainer. We had to like, just watch until Lane was picking and then we knew it was kind of the right time. Now we have to kind of make our own decision, which is much harder. Lane has a style of, of sort of, she calls it feminine wines, um, higher acid, low alcohol, really bright. It wasn't really a popular style then, but I think that it is more so now, and a lot of people make their wine that way, and I think that's Lane's influence. Right, and she never, she never took her eye off that approach because that was what she believed in. Her belief system is so strong. When I first started, uh, there was a real difference between my winemaking and anybody else in this area. You know, I was picking early, I was 100% destems. stems I was making wines that were, were lean and racy, and everybody else was picking late, uh, doing a lot of stems, trying to go a little funky sometimes because everything in funky was really cool. Um, and so they would get these jammy high alcohol, kind of, you know, overbearing, and this is what I call manly wines, um, where I was I was just making these, these more pretty, I mean, just plain pretty. <sighs> And I was dogged for it. I mean, most people were like, oh, Lane, these are too light, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's always, there's always something, you know. They used to call her low pick Lane when she was younger and, and would chuckle about it. And then the funny thing is, is that now they're all trying to follow in her footsteps. So, you know, as far as how I was rated and how I was viewed was really bizarre. However, for the first time about two years ago, Frank Ostini, actually I was on a panel with him, and he actually noted that about, about what was happening. He said, you know, Lane's been doing this forever and we're just now doing it. And I felt so good about that, that, that statement. It was like, you know, okay, so that ostracism for like, what, 25 years? I'm fine with it now. 
And she was never dismissive of others. She, was, she never spoke negatively of anyone. She never was like, oh, that's lame, you'll see. Like she wasn't trying to prove any point. She's like, oh, this is what I do. And you know, you guys go get them. But like, this is my jam. They just, it just was the fact that nobody had been making those kind of wines. And so it was new. Nobody knew how to categorize them. My score sucked because, you know, you have something that's different and, and you've got these wine tasters that are so used to this kind of thing and they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm omnivorous on my palate. They're not. They, they have views and their views are what they've just tasted for the last six years. I mean, I would argue that if you had her wines from 30 years ago and her wines now, I, I think that through line would be so pure and so precise and so lucid. In more recent times, people have really started to realize that she was right all along. How do I know Lane is interesting? Because I was working in Los Angeles in high tech and our group of uh, buddies, you know, that we hung out with, we used to come up here to wine country all the time. And we would come up here to this place called uh, the Wine and Spirits Emporium, which is outside of Los Olivos and Lane's wine was sold there. She was pouring wine in the Emporium one day and she had just come out with this, uh, I don't know if it was curated or how it happened, but she had a statue had been made of her, it was a nude statue with grapes and um, there was two of them. And I think one was purchased by somebody. It was probably a shrine to Elaine somewhere, or should be, uh, but I don't know, she might have the other one. How did a nude statue come to be made of your likeness? Well, Greek goddess style, nonetheless. Uh, you know, actually, there was a, a gentleman in uh, Solvang, Robert Holtling, and he is—he's a sculptor, and he—he he wanted to sculpt. He—he he knew he wanted to sculpt a female winemaker, and he had an idea of me in repose. This was when I was about my late thirties, and so he invited me over to his house to get naked so he could take pictures. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God. And I'm thinking, oh, what the hell? So I go over there and luckily his wife is there too. And they take a bunch of pictures of me and and uh, we have lunch and, and I never heard from him again. And and I had so many friends come up and go, hey, you know, I bet they'll show up on the internet sooner or later. And so a long time later, all of a sudden he comes up with this picture with the, you know, with the, the, the nude statue of me standing on my, you know, on my toes, holding like this and like this, which if you know anything about women's bodies, standing on your toes like that makes your butt looks great and your legs look great. And having my arm underneath my boobs made my boobs look great. So so it was really great. He said, Lane, I just, I, all the pictures I kept looking at, he said, you just had too much energy to be reposed. I just had to have you up and standing. So that's how that, that became that. And an added caveat, my bucket list, I did get that, uh, that was, was it one spectator, one enthusiast that actually did a picture of my uh, my statue, which means I am nude in an international magazine. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of like in, in sports, they talk about a coaching tree, you know? Like Greg Popovich in basketball is a huge coaching tree. I think it's the same way in, in winemaking. I mean, I think with winemaking, mentorship is really important because you can learn winemaking at a university and you're going to get a pretty boilerplate uh, way of approaching things. But what sets winemakers apart from one another really is the style that they develop over years. Pretty much everybody who started their own winery apprenticed somewhere for a harvest or two to learn at the feet of other people. You know, that early, the early group that was all working together at, uh, at you know, Zaka University, um, I think they all learn from each other. And during harvest, we would go visit each other and talk about, you know, this or that, and talk about, you know, maybe some fruit over here you might want to try. So, you know, we were we were kind of like a family. So it is a mentorship that, you know, everybody was kind of working with each other. I don't think anybody in, in this community, in, in Santa Barbara County winemaking, wants to hold on to their secrets of winemaking. Everybody wants to help everybody else. And for the new generation of winemakers, that's teaching and showing and um, taking them under their wing. And Lane's been great at that. When my husband first started out winemaking, he, he had no experience whatsoever. Um, and she came in and, and took a look around. And the first thing she did was set him up with a brand new lab, um, knowing that he couldn't do his job without that. It's been really important as far as uh, developing my winemaking style because, I mean, really Lane's style is the only one I know. And uh, her, her tricks of the trade are the only ones that I've learned, but 
thankfully, that always tends to create a wine that I'm proud to uh, have my name on and also to, to uh, drink nightly. <laughs> Somebody that has touched a lot of people in terms of their ideas and passed that on is, you know, they're not just affecting one or two people, it ripples out to many people. I need to go to my other go-to winemakers, uh, Rick Longoria, who worked with Andre Telechev. We just drank one of Andre's wines last night, a 1970 BV Cab that was stunning. So we can taste that movement from Andre Telechev coming from Russia through, Bur you know, through Bordeaux into Napa and then coming down to Santa Barbara. So maybe it starts with Andre Telechev giving us that. But yeah, now Andre, Andre Chelstev was, was definitely my mentor. He's the one that got me into this business. Okay, so Andre, for just those people that don't know, white Russian, uh, his family was real high up in, in the hierarchy as far as his, his sister was actually a Tsarina. She was married to a Tsar. So um, during the Bolshevik Revolution, of course, he had to flee pretty darn fast. Um, and he ended up in uh, France, got a... Uh, got a degree in enology, then came to California and was really the first really high quality enologist in California. He was the one that, that brought us uh, cold, stable, cold tanks, chilling your tanks. Hey, what a great idea. We didn't do that before Andre was here. And he, um, he ended up mentoring so many people. He, he worked for, uh, for BV, and then after he left there, he he did uh, consulting, and he consulted for so many wineries, and uh, that's that's how I found him was uh, was the whole story of getting into the wine industry. Okay, so I'm I have to go back. I'm in Glendive, Montana, <laughs> doing a a pre power plant study, which means I go to a cow field every day and check the weather and check the, the everything, the, you know, the temperature, where, which way the wind's blowing. So anyway, I'm thinking I gotta get out of this whole business because I really, I had no home life. I would do, I would do jobs on the road, come home for, you know, a, a week or two and then go back out. So I had no boyfriends, no, no private friends, really no house. So I just thought, you know, I gotta get out of this business. And I, uh, I quit, went back to Lake County, thought I would spend a summer on my mom's couch and then go to San Francisco and get a real chemistry job, a real science job, which is really what I've always wanted. One day the phone rings and it's a local winery looking for my mom to help them bottle. And she'd already gotten a job. So I said, my name's Lane Tanner. And uh, while I'm in town, you know, I, I could do that. And so I did it. And during the, uh, during the day, they found out I was a chemist. So it's like, well, you know, can you do some chemistry while you're in town? And I said, I don't see why not. You know, I had no idea about wine whatsoever, but you know, as with any science, they give you the book, the lab book, and you just do it. So not a big deal. So Monday morning, I'm there at eight o'clock, ready to do some wine chemistry. And I'm sitting in the lab and I'm waiting for somebody to come in and tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. And instead of anybody else coming in, the winemaker came in with Andre Chelichev. Now, here's the deal. I have no clue who he was at that point. Uh, all I see is this guy, my height, one big old eyebrow. And the weird thing is, is I'm introduced to this guy as the new enologist. And I'm like, in my mind, of course, what does that mean? <laughs> so Andre says, let's have Lane taste with us. And I'm thinking, well, what, is that? what the hell is this about? And the, the winemaker can't say no. I mean, Bill Pease couldn't just say no out Andre. I mean, Andre is like this god. So we go into this room and they're pouring wines and, and I have no clue what we're supposed to be doing here. I mean, you have to remember, I don't even drink wine at this point. And then they throw some wine in their mouth and do the <laughs> And so I throw some wine, I can do that pretty good. And then they spit into spit tunes. And I'm like looking around the room. I was like, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> and Andre hands me a coffee cup and I don't even spit into it. I just literally like drool into it because it turns out women really aren't taught to spit either <laughs> during that time period. Then Andre starts quizzing me. He's like, well, what can you smell? What can you taste? And, and here is the aha moment it was right there because I always had this incredibly sensitive a sense of smell and taste. And up until that very moment, it had been one of the horriblest banes of my life. 
I would go someplace, well, let's just say like to my grandmother's refrigerator, and I would open it up and the smell would just knock me over. And, uh, you know, grandma would go, it's like, no, everything's fine. There's like, no, grandma, something's not right. So all of a sudden, this guy is like, like saying, you know, this is great. And I'm thinking, great, are you kidding? You live with my nose for a while and tell me this is great. But anyway, he seems impressed. Time comes to go to lunch. They put me back in the lab. They go off to lunch. They come back and Bill Pease walks into the office and he goes, Lane, is there any way you can stay and be our analogy person? Because Andre really likes you. And I just was like, okay. <laughs> I now know, I mean, because, you know, there are a lot of years behind me here in the industry that he did this to quite a few women, which was finding women that were, that were, a chemistry or let's just say seriously lab oriented scientist types and pulling them into the industry. Uh, and uh, I just happen to be one of them. So without him, I would not be sitting here today. And then the, the movie, the sideways movie, that messed me up totally. That movie. Do you know in like Harry Potter where they don't name Voldemort? Yeah, we don't name sideways. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless you're out there in Pinot Noir country, but here at Buttonwood Farm, we grow Merlot. So let me tell you what that movie did. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, you know, 60, uh, 61 uh, Chival Blanc out of, a, out of a plastic cup at the, at, the, at the end of a really awful, misogynistic movie. Pinot was hard to get to begin with, but then all of a sudden, everybody and their mother wanted to make Pinot. These people are coming down from Napa taking my Pinot, and all of a sudden, you know, my, my little grapes that were like maybe 1,200 a ton are now 3,000 a ton. I can't touch them if I could get them to begin with, and I go out in the market. And now everybody that's made Pinot is dumping Pinot because they can't sell it. So, you know, I'm talking to these, I'm talking to these accounts and they're, they're like, okay, so how much is it? And then, you know, it's like this. And so, so how many cases do I have to, to buy to get the free cases? Like, what do you mean the free cases? I said, well, that last guy said if I bought three, I could get a, a fourth case free. It's like, no, can't do it. And so it messed me totally. It, I just, I was, uh, I can't tell you just how frustrated I was with the whole thing. I was frustrated enough that I quit. I, I decided just I wasn't going to sell my label, I was simply going to retire it. So in 09, that was the last year of the Lane Tanner label, and then I took 10 and 11 off vintage-wise. And that's when I realized I'm bored shitless. So I got back into the business in 12. Uh, we were very distressed when uh, she was going to retire, and she retired for a year uh, from her own brand, Lane Tanner and then happily went to work with Will at uh, Lumen because we, it was distressing to not think that Lane was making wine anymore. Now I knew Will because his dad Warner uh, from the Henry Wine Group fame, he uh, sold my wines forever. So I kind of knew the family a bit. Come to find out he'd, he'd made this life plan, a very smart one too, if he just stuck with it. So Will comes to me and says, well, Lynn, you know, I think I've changed my plan on what I want to do now, and I think we should make one, and, and I, I'd like you to be my partner. And I just said, no way. <laughs> so um, he came back again, and I said no. And then the third time he came back, he said, well, what about this? If I make you my partner and give you a salary? And it's like, okay, so how could you say no to that? Jeez. So yeah, so I said, yeah. And uh, we, we started our first vintage on 13. And it's, it's been super fun. So for the region, I think that they will see her as, you know, the, the matriarch of female winemaking, female winemakers. At the same time, there's humility about Lane. You know, she's not running around, like, telling everybody how awesome she is, you know? So hopefully people are listening enough to others, i.e., you know, me or whoever, and, and, and recognize and realize and, and revere and respect the impact that her presence has and will always have on not only Santa Barbara, but the wine industry in general. I hope she keeps going far, far, far into the future uh, for the county. Lasting impressions, I don't think I have a big enough personality to make a huge lasting impression. I think probably uh, if any one thing, let's just pretend one thing. Okay, we'll go with two. First off, you can pick early. <laughs> and have some really great wines. And second off, you can be a, a girl and still be taken serious. You can dress up and look as fun or as sexy as you want 
and you can still work like a dog and do stuff. It's Lane Tanner. She very singularly became such a force, you know, um, and got, and the impact of that, I think we haven't even felt it completely. You know, that's going to go on for generations. You know, looking back on Santa Barbara County, it's like you, it's like she's, she's part of that, like, initial explosion. And she, I think she's the one that lit the fuse. Why does both the Greco-Roman and the Judeo-Christian history agree where wine began? The middle generation, they gave a, a voice really to Santa Barbara. You know, you've got uh, people basically in my age group from like their 50s or so, uh, recognized the work that all the pioneers had done and, and um, also really believed in the area and, and decided to kind of hop on the back of the pioneers and you know, in some cases work with them, in other cases start their own show. I think the middle generation were properly conservative in maintaining the production methods of the winemakers that taught us to make wine. Automatically, I made wine almost in the exact same style that Brian Babcock taught me. So I think the middle generation took what the pioneers gave us and we were conservative in producing wines that weren't completely crazy off the, you know, off of what we learned. Every microcosm needs a few Jim Glendennens and Richard Sanfords and and uh, Bruno D'Alfonso's and, and, and Wes Hagen's, you know, you, you movers and shakers, you know, people that maybe, you know, drink one too many cups of coffee in the morning. You got to have these people. And, and uh, Wes is one of those guys. Wes is one of the most articulate spokespeople about wine in Santa Barbara County that exists today, I think. Oh boy. One word to describe Wes Hagen, that's a tough one. Is mad scientist one word or is that two words? Ooh, still strength, Fortaleza Silver. Hello, I love you. This, uh, the Ocho Silver and the Fortaleza Silver. Yeah. I could be happy the rest of my life drinking those. The wheel, they've got a name for the winners in the world. I, I want a name when I lose. I strongly believe this to be the greatest album to both start and finish a party with. It's um, Steely Dan. Um, Asia? Asia? Yeah, yep. Um, it gets the party going slowly and mellow, and then it's like, like three people left, and they're not quite sober enough to, to drive home chill out, drink water, listen to Steely Dan again. Wes Hagen speaks beautiful English. He has a way with the English language and with the way that he communicates. And Wes can, you know, shout it from the rooftops and he's getting the message out there. So the first thing that comes to mind when I hear the name Wes Hagen is educator. So Wes came to the wine industry from a career in academics. And you have to have great teachers in order for a wine region to really reach its apex. I, I like to joke uh, that when I was teaching high school, the kids drove me to drink and that I went pro and it worked out really well. Um, but the honesty is uh, in 1999, I was brought to uh, Burgundy uh, on a trip. So what I learned in Burgundy is I tasted a wine in 1972, Chapelle Chambertin from Louis Trappé that made me cry and made me want to be a winemaker. Not because I wanted to replicate it, but it would be like, you know, um, watching Chinatown or watching uh, Citizen Kane and wanting and, and being struck by the beauty of filmmaking. And you don't want to make another Citizen Kane. You want to make something that represents what you do, the growing and the making. So that was kind of it. He's an incredibly knowledgeable guy who can get into the most geeky aspects of winemaking with you or even of, uh, of wine growing. But he, he's also great at shaping the, that message so that the consumer can completely understand it and, and wrap their arms around it. Wes is always a friendly guy. He obviously brings his enthusiasm and knowledge to the wine business. He's one of the most genuinely good and decent and fair human beings I know. He's got this compass that always points north and that he's one of those people that's always building other people up. That he, I've never seen him belittle a person or a dog, right? <laughs> and for him, I think those are actually on par, right, and equal. 
We work in an industry that has been so efficient about looking down at our customer, trying to confuse them, make them feel like they don't know what's going on, right? Whereas Wes took the 180 approach, and I assume drawing on his academic background, but his natural tendencies to want to teach, and he finds the right way to connect with whatever the wine IQ is of the person that he's interacting with so that they leave feeling good about themselves. He gets people really excited about wine. Um, he relates it to different aspects of their lives and just really engages people about wine in a way that I, I've never seen anybody else engage people about wine. Wes is one of those guys that uh, has the attribute of taking those senses that, that aren't dealt with as much, you know, in the arts. The arts are very visual or they're tactile or the music, the sense of sound. And Wes is just so brilliant at taking the sense of taste and, and, and sense of smell and then, you know, delivering his ideas and his passion very artistically. It was like meeting somebody that had answers to questions that I had had for a long time that no one had really been able to answer. I'd say Wes does this through kind of encyclopedia knowledge of everything, right? You cannot separate Western culture from the development of wine, especially in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, where wine symposia and, um, and convivium, where, where uh, politicians would come together. And you could argue that the Greek symposia in the golden age of Athens was actually um, formative in democracy. These conversations that people would have under the influence of wine, never drunk, but never sober. So I love this idea that wine carried civilization and that wine civilized us. And then so wine press led to printing press, printing press led to literacy, literacy led to lenses, lenses le lent to the development of the telescope and the microscope to understand the microbial universe below us and the cosmological universe above us. So poetically, all microscopy, all science, all medicine can be traced back to that one wine press that Gutenberg uh, changed into a printing press. The pioneers of Santa Barbara County not only gave me the passion and the education and everything, but let's talk about what they actually did in the wines that taught me. So the first Pinot Noir that I ever tasted that really turned my head on uh, was a 1980s Byron wine that Ken Brown made. And uh, it really lit my head up as a young man. And then when a guy like me comes in, kind of in the middle, right? Middle generation, I go to the Hitching Post one night and meet Chris Whitcraft and ask him, hey, Chris, I wanna make Pinot Noir. I was in my 20s. He goes, you know, there's drugs you can take to prevent that. I said, no, I did them all in college. I still wanted to be a winemaker. He goes, rock on. Well, whatever you need from me, go talk to Brian Babcock, your, your neighbor. I went over to Brian. I said, hey, Brian, I wanna make wine. Should I go to Fresno or da Davis? He goes, you could go to either and you'd get out with a degree and you still wouldn't know how to hook up a hose and drive a forklift. Why don't you just come work for me this year? I'll pay you minimum wage and I'll, I'll work you to the bone. I said, okay, so I got a job. It was interesting, a lot of times when I'd ask him winemaking information, he would say, oh, this is something that Brian Babcock told me or that Rick Longoria told me, which is obviously really cool to uh, to learn from and learn about. This business is not cut out for everybody. It's a hard business. It's, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work and, you know, blood, sweat and tears. It doesn't work for everybody. The people that it works for, you know, they love it, they celebrate it. Um, the dirtier they get, the better off they feel. And Wes was one of those guys, you know, it was about halfway through harvest where he just, he, he couldn't get any dirtier or any happier. And I just thought this guy, he, this guy's gonna be okay. As I got into the business, he was always just super happy to share information, give guidance. You know, he was very much a wine mentor for me. So what I learned from these original winemakers is not about Napa power. It's not about concentration. It's not about color. It's about making a wine that's beautiful and that represents the time and the place that Santa Barbara, not trying to be Sonoma, not trying to be Burgundy, but trying to be ourselves. I learned um, that there wasn't an over need for tricks. So many people want to sell you, you know, extra oak, extra tannin, extra color, mega purple, all of these things. And they're very popular in certain regions. The greatest thing about Santa Barbara County, we don't need to do any of that. The fruit is so good that we're like kickers on a Super Bowl team. That's what they taught me. This county supports and elevates us because of the quality of the fruit and the people that are out there farming it, that once we get fruit in the winery, we just need to be competent and learn from the guys who came before us.
He's one of these guys that's like an ambassador for Santa Barbara County wine, if not wine in general. You know, you just, you listen to Wes Hagen talk about wine and you get excited, no, no matter where that wine's coming from. And, and so it's an, it's an influence that's continuing to grow. Um, you know, I don't, he's not done yet. He's still, he's still taking a swing, so. So myself and John Dragonette uh, got our start working at a wine shop down in Los Angeles. And one of the cast of characters from Santa Barbara who was the most inspiring to us was Wes Hagen. So Wes would visit the wine shop and tell us stories about what was happening in Santa Barbara. And he always did this in such a way that was incredibly inspiring. So, you know, so much so that we started to think about making wine in the area. I don't know if I would have ended up in Santa Barbara County if it wasn't for Wes Hagen. You know, I started making wine from a bunch of different places, and but Santa Barbara was always kind of what excited me the most. And I, I can't imagine that, that the, the excitement that Wes had uh, imparted, I can't imagine that didn't have a huge influence on my ending up there. The visibility for Santa Barbara is really important, and uh, he's been critical in developing that. You know, he's traveled throughout the country, extolling the virtues of Santa Barbara in a lot of the ways that Jim Clenenda did as well, talking about Santa Barbara, why Santa Barbara is, uh, is so special. I woke up on March 12th, realizing that in 48 hours, the Miller family was going to probably have a conference and start to decide how COVID was going to fundamentally change their wine company. I'm a traveling salesman. What the hell am I going to do? So instead of waiting for them to either decide that maybe I, I was going to get laid off for a little while or just on, on a little bit of weight or whatever, um, furlough or whatever, I decided to reinvent myself. So that day I invented an uh, internet wine show. We are recording in progress and it is official. Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the first June 2021. A punch down show brought to you by the Miller Family Wine Company. If there's two people who love mapping terroir in the world, uh, it's it's our friends uh, from Venice Media, Antonio Galloni. I am saying that absolutely correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, cool. I know. Um, and we are absolutely and 100% live. So thank you so much for being with me. I wanted a huge punch down welcome. Uh, to uh, Elaine, Chuck, and Brown. L welcome to Jake, welcome to Lawrence, uh, Lowe's, and Peter. Uh, Tom O'Higgins, of course, who is uh, related to uh, the uh, liberator of uh, Chile, um, Bernardo O'Higgins. Because what I realized from the first day, what this meant is a lot of people were gonna just be at home having sips throughout the day, and what an opportunity to learn about wine. And all the crap that I have floating around in my mind, I needed a, a boat to load it on and throw it into the into the public, right? Um, so I needed a vehicle and the vehicle was the internet. And so I started doing an hour, five to six, seven nights a week. And it started as a hangout. It started as, what do you got open? What are you drinking? Oh, I know a little something about that wine. You want me to tell you a little bit about that wine? And slowly what I realized, it was slowly becoming a hangout for my friends and their friends, and it started getting a little bit better. And once I was uh, inoculated, vaccinated, and ready to rock and get back into the market, uh, we we put it to bed. Uh, and what was fun is the last interview, and I had some amazing interviews: Antonio Galloni and uh, you know Karen McNeil and uh, uh, four different master sommeliers. Uh, and the last interview, happened to know, was me. Uh, Tracy Dutton, a uh, sommelier from uh, the CIA in Greystone, she came on and my last show was, I got interviewed. So I thought that was a nice way to put it to bed. Of all of Wes's accomplishments, if you're gonna take the lens of how does the region view Wes, I'd probably point to the fact that he's the only living winemaker that has written the amount of AVAs he has here in, in Santa Barbara County. And so man, that's been a very tangible contribution that literally changed the map here in Santa Barbara County. And so. In my mind, if we had like the equivalent of UNESCO heritage sites for people, like West would be that to Santa Barbara County. Yeah, so rather than taking a sense of ownership only on his home turf out in Santa Rita Hills, the fact that Wes was instrumental in creating the Happy Canyon of Santa Barbara AVA, the new AVA in Los Alamos, that's something that ties back into that thread of humility throughout Santa Barbara County because he could have easily been proprietary with that knowledge. And I think a lot of people in a lot of their areas would have done that and just sort of stuck within their own zone. But I think Wes's story it's spotlighting not just each of the little AVAs and subregion in Santa Barbara, but it's spotlighting all of Santa Barbara County in general. Well, uh, something came up the other day as we were we were discussing a, a certain anniversary that's coming up for the establishment of the Santa Rita Hills and the Santa Rita Hills Wine Growers and their association. And we were hearkening back to uh, uh, the days where we were in the field 
and uh, trying to identify some geographical places or spots or things that we could use as a framework to draw the boundary lines for, the, for this appellation. Um, Richard Sanford was the ambassador. He was kind of our de facto president that, you know, rallied the troops, got us all together, gave us the table to sit at, kept us from killing each other. And so we're sitting in one of the meetings and we had our, we had our boundary lines. We'd all had a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> and Richard Sanford said, okay, well now we've got to find somebody to write the document, the petition. We have to petition the TTB or the ATF at the time. We have to say, we have to convince them uh, that, that we are worthy of this, this new appellation. And everybody's just looking at everybody like, no, I don't want it to, <laughs> you know, it's like I can hardly, sp I, you know, spelling, no, not, you know, paragraph, sentence structure. And then there's a voice at the far end of the table and somebody, so this guy raises his hand and goes, well, I was an English major. <laughs> and so everybody just points at us and goes, you're the guy. <laughs> You're the guy that's going to write this petition. And of course, Wes, you know, not, don't, not only did he write it, but he crushed it. And, uh, you know, here we are 20 some years later, and, and it's one of the most revered appellations in the state of California. Um, and I just I, I thank God that there was somebody in the room that could write. As the pioneers have started to retire or sell their brands and move on, that West really, I think, naturally fills that role here in Santa Barbara County of becoming the, the new um, elder statesman, if you will. I, I think his legacy is going to be that of getting getting more people interested in wine, getting people excited about wine. Where, whereas he would say it's it's something to bring a, an hour of joy to a family dinner table. I think that's too simple for the kind of fire that he ignites in people. When I think about my legacy in wine, and specifically in Santa Barbara County wine, the first thing I want people to realize is no one can tell a story about me being flippant, unkind, unwilling to help. I want to be remembered as a guy who will take a phone call, take an email, take moments out of my days to answer a text of anyone in the industry who wants to get into the industry. I want to be Julie McCoy, cruise director for anyone who wants to come into Santa Barbara County and enjoy the manifest beauty of our hills, our sunshine, our ocean, all the thing that makes it special. I think that when we look at the history of Santa Barbara County, Wes is going to be so important in the sense that he literally has written the story in the sense of writing the different AVAs. Uh, so taking the time, the energy, the research to go through and define what a region is is something that's pretty phenomenal. It's interesting, he showed um, he showed us some photographs that he took. They're photos of a small group of punks from Lompoc, um, winemakers and wine growers, as we uh, trespassed our way through uh, property after property in the Santa Rita Hills to try to find these, these geographic points that would become the framework of the Santa Rita Hills and our boundaries. And, and Wes um, captured some moments uh, with the camera. and. Uh, they're just uh, really powerful photographs. And so you can see that, um, you know, how, how does Wes influence people? What's his greatest achievement? It's almost like his achievement is it's, it's coming out of him on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the way he shares and the way he expresses his, his, um, his, his energy and, and his, uh, his poetry. Um, it's, yeah, it, at times it's stunning. It's natural too. It's not like he works. You don't get the feeling like he's really working on being influential. You know, I just talk to him. So if my legacy is anything, I can probably sum it down to one sentence that I say every single time I talk about wine, which is that wine is an investment to keep the people we love at table for an extra hour every day. And what would you pay for that? The way I see the, the new generation, what they're setting up for the, for the next generation is, I think, just a region that's going to be on the world stage. You know, nowadays you've got a lot of really young winemakers that are choosing this as their career path. Either they came in as uh, assistant winemakers out of Davis or another wine program. Now you've got this, you know, youthful exuberance of the new winemakers that are, that are 
trying new things and working with different clonal material and different new vineyards and that kind of thing. So this third wave is sort of like a refinement. I mean, you know, there were some stylistic things in the middle wave when we were becoming popular and critically reviewed. A lot of the style in those days was making sort of larger styled wines, bigger wines that were getting noticed by Robert Parker and people like that. That influence has sort of waned in the last 10 years and, and people are making more varied style wines. Being a new generation winemaker means taking what the past has given us and building upon it. What makes Jessica stand out in her generation is top-notch winemaking. Jessica, she sets the pace. I mean, she comes in, she's driven, she knows what she wants to get done. She gets it done in a way that's inspiring to everyone around her. You know, I think one thing about Jessica is she's constantly learning and constantly curious. And, you know, I think that's what drives her. She's been so careful and meticulous uh, in her approach to creating her winery. Most people, when they start out, they're, they're bootstrapping. Uh, they're buying fruit that they can afford and figuring it out along the way. And that is not what Jessica has done. But I think when we look at Santa Barbara, we see a place where there's much more humility. And Jessica really represents that sense of humility. You know, we're, we're, what we're doing is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. You know, we're hopefully changing the world by making people happy, but we're doing it in a way that, I mean, it involves agriculture. At the end of the day, wine is an agricultural pursuit. And so I think it's always so important to tie things back to the vineyard. And I look at the way that Jessica does that by the way that she interacts with her vineyard crews. That's very, very rare to have a proprietor, to have an owner out in the field, talking with the crew, working one-on-one -on -one with the vineyard crew without a sense of hierarchy. I think that's critically, critically important. Good morning. We are, we are here for the, our very first pick, Harvest 2021. We're gonna be picking some Gamay Noir from Martian Ranch Vineyard. It's a certified biodynamic vineyard. Awesome little vineyard, been working with it for about, this will be my fifth year. And it's about 5 a.m. It's a little chilly. It's a beautiful night slash morning. And so when I think about something that makes Jessica special, her willingness to think outside of herself, outside of her own brand, and on a more community basis, that's something that's super special. I'll give a little anecdote. During the COVID era, um, she spearheaded an initiative to vaccinate vineyard workers. And, and the way that what she did when she brought together that initiative to vaccinate the workers is something that, I mean, it resonates on a real personal level with all of us. And I really think that you know the community wouldn't be the same without her. I remember uh, listening to a speech she gave on behalf of the foundation she runs and she talked about conversations that she overheard out in different vineyards, uh, vineyards that employ uh, either labor contracted um, employees or temporary employees for harvest and she was moved when she overheard a conversation between two vineyard workers that um, you know they were they were chatting and they were both talking about after working all night uh, the next jobs that they were going to. And she was so empathetic to, you know, the fact that these people are working, you know, that hard, that many hours a day. How are they taking care of their family and how are they spending time with their children? And she's taken it upon herself to make sure they're better taken care of. She's engaged with a lot of the young winemakers, a lot of women winemakers. And I think she's really been instrumental in uh, bringing them to the forefront and uh, kind of a new chapter in the in the industry within our county. Having really strong female figures who are doing their own thing and really leading by a sense of ownership, I think that's really gonna be inspiration. It's already inspirational now, and it's gonna continue to inspire the next generation here in Santa Barbara. 
Uh, she's been meticulous in uh, the vineyard sites. She's been paying top dollar for the best fruit. And she's been very careful in the cuvées that she's making. Um, and that has set her apart. And so what you have in wines that have a little less alcohol and a little more elegance is that you see more nuance in the wines. There's more layers of things happening. People often comment when they come into taste that my wines aren't as aggressive, that my wines are lighter, that my wines are prettier. They aren't as heavy handed. I think that's a really interesting take because I'm not doing anything other than wanting to stay out of the way of the grapes. Um, so I choose to be minimal intervention. I choose not to extract uh, in certain ways. You know, I don't pull Sagne to change the juice to skin ratio. I don't stir lees. I don't um, use new oak because I don't want you to taste the oak. I want you to taste the land, the place. Does that translate into lighter, prettier, f more feminine wines? Maybe, but I also believe in a woman's touch. Um, if you look at the history of women and men, right? Men were hunters and women were gatherers. So my job, you know, way back when was to go pick berries, smell berries, taste berries, decide, you know, while, while my man was out, you know, killing an ox, my job was to, to gather and really using the senses, my eyes, my nose, my, you know, my, my palate to, to make sure that what I was taking in for my family was safe. And I, I have to believe that there's still something within us, you know, that is coming out somehow with how women are making wine these days. And we can look at the quality of the wine and her commitment to her vineyards and whatnot. But I think that actually her sense of compassion is something that's really unique to her. She really cares about everyone around her and everybody involved in the entire process. And that's something you can feel when you're you know, working with her or you're hanging out with her, even in a casual setting. Uh, it's something that I really admire. Uh, you know, she's devoted more time and energy uh, to the cause of helping the ag community than most folks that have been, you know, spending an entire career in Santa Barbara County wine. I think when you see passion, you know, it, it, it sort of regenerates that in yourself. You know, it reminds you of why you're doing what you're doing because I'm very passionate about winemaking and what I do. And to see it in someone that you're trying to help and possibly mentor is inspiring. You know, it just relights the flame in you. I'm really aiming to stay on the side of organics and biodynamics and making wine as natural as I can. I really believe, you know, we live in a farm to table world of food and why we aren't paying attention to what we put in our body as far as wine is concerned. I think that's an important topic and it's a topic that I'm very passionate about and it's one that I talk about all the time um, in my tasting room when guests come in is the realization that not all wines are created equal. The respect is given to, to the generation that founded us. Learning, you know, from those who came before us, studying from those who came before us, and then our generation is to take what they've so lovingly give us, respect it, and continue it forward. I think Jessica knew that she wouldn't become a winemaker overnight. And she was very patient. She put in her time. She worked for other great winemakers. Uh, so I think she took pieces from every mentor she had and fixated on her path. And she's doing what she does today. I actually wanted to go to college for, for acting. My parents were not super thrilled with that idea. Um, again, the passion side, I actually uh, dropped out of, of college to move to L.A. to pursue that. I didn't have what it takes to be a, like a film actress or, you know, be on the big screen. But I loved the art. I loved, like, I was cr classically trained in Shakespeare. I love theater. It's It was an incredible part of my life. And so I decided to move to New York. I wanted to, to pursue the art of 
being on the stage, not behind the film. Um, I was 23 and I had to have a job. So I bartended. Um, I was a bartender at a, a little French restaurant on the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan. And I didn't drink, uh, I wasn't a drinker, but every like Tuesday, our sommelier would give us wine classes. And I had to serve wine to people that would come in and order wine. And here I was not even knowing the difference between a Chardonnay and a Cabernet, but I would have these wine classes and I was very intrigued and I became very interested. And I started tasting and learning, you know, little by little. And that's really where I got bit by the wine bug uh, initially was living in New York City um, and learning a little bit about wine. I failed miserably at being a New Yorker, by the way. <laughs> I'm a Southern California girl, so I lived, I moved to New York. It was really hot during the summer and it was really cold during the winter. Uh, so I did fail. I, I, I moved back to home with my my tail between my legs and did not, I couldn't cut it in New York City. She just decided she wanted to make wine and she, uh, she knew me. So I called him, said, hey Gary, I was wondering if you would teach me how to make wine. <laughs> and uh, he said, you can come work harvest. You know, I can't pay you, you can be an intern. Uh, I'm happy to teach you. And so 2009 harvest, I came up. And uh, she ended up, like I say, living with us for, uh, for a period of time and, and worked at our winery and then uh, started making her wines at our winery as, as well. And, uh, the, I'd say probably the first 10 vintages at our, at, our, at our winery. It was so magical. It was so inspiring. It was so just fulfilling that that space inside that wants to come out it was it just like lit up all that and i knew i knew from that harvest that this is what i wanted to do for the rest of my life within just a few years of producing story of soil she has become one of the best wineries located in, in los Olivos. there are dozens of tasting rooms and story of soil has become the top three or four recommended uh wineries there and people are flocking to, to buy the wines. She's selling out. Uh, she has built an amazing reputation uh, for her wines. And I think this is just the start, but already an amazing accomplishment. This wine journey has been such an incredible learning curve. You know, I came into this knowing nothing. And so I really owe it to the people that have taken the time. First and foremost, my uncle, Gary Burke, who didn't have to the first year say, yes, I'll teach you. From day one, he has been so kind and so open and, and warm and guiding. And I could have asked him a million questions and every time was answered with a kind heart. And he was an open book. I still call him every year, every single year, multiple times a year. And I say, Gary, I have a question. Uh, will you troubleshoot with me, you know? And he's always so kind and so patient. So without him, I would not be here. And I owe every single solitary accomplishment I have to him for giving me a chance. I'll also say that uh, my first wine job for Matias, his name's Matias Pippig. He's the owner and winemaker of Sanguis Winery in Santa Barbara. I learned so much from him, not just about wine making. Um, I learned a lot about wine business. I worked for the Dragonettes for five years and what an incredible company, what an incredible family. Um, the three guys, John and Steve Dragonette and Brandon Sparks Gillis, their dedication to a program that is geared at high quality was one of the biggest lessons for me as far as like what I wanted to accomplish for Story of Soil. And I was so lucky to be able to watch these guys make some of the best wine in Santa Barbara County, be right there in the winery. And so watching them was, was incredible. Mentors still, I still call Brandon, I still call John, I still call, I still call all of them. Jessica is the future of Santa Barbara County. Jessica mandates only the best farming in her vineyards. She selects the most optimal sites, and the quality of her wine uh, is the future. I think Jessica's legacy is going to be you know, 
carrying on from the heritage that we've all had from the pioneers in terms of that hard work ethic and that sort of sense of ownership, which can easily lead into ego. And I think one of Jessica's most amazing things with her legacy is her lack of ego. I hope to be considered a person in this industry that helps create new pathways. And in that, I mean, going back to showing people that, you know, I made this from nothing. So hopefully I can help mentor people or even inspire people to know that they can do it. You know, that for me is one way as a new generation winemaker to show that this is possible. You can do things like this. Um, another way is, you know, as I'm, as I'm getting more involved in my community, I'm realizing that it's not, it's not just about story of soil. It's not just about Santa Barbara County. It's about all of us in this together old generation and the new generation working together, but for what? Um, and so one of the things I've done is to invest a little bit more in my community uh, as, a, as the president of the Santa Barbara Vintners Foundation, which is our non-for-profit non organization here where we raise money uh, and we're aiming to raise money to start a healthcare program for our vineyard workers. So things like that, I feel like are things I can do to one, lead by example, to leave this world a better place and hopefully inspire the next generation to get up and do, and, and not just in wine, but also in the community. As we climb this mountain, while we shall. It's our revolution. We thank the pioneers who saw the vision clear. Now it's our turn. The groundwork and the path will help us remember. This is where we stand on the shoulders of giants as we climb the mountain. We reach our